All right, guys, we're going to get started here. I am still the only one in the room, but I got plenty of you online, so that's good enough for me. Well, so here's what we're going to do today is we're going to go through and we're going to talk about the business plan. So um, where I want to start with, actually, though, is, well, first, I'm going to mute. We got some background noise, so I'm going to mute you guys. So you can unmute yourself if you need to ask a question or want to ask a question or anything. So just know that uh, you have the ability to do that. Um, I'm excited to get to be with you guys and share with you some thoughts on business planning. Um, it's a good time of the year to be starting to think about our business plan. And not only if you already are a licensed agent, but if you're a new agent, then obviously it's a really good time to get started on that. So uh, here's what I want you to do though. So if you guys will in your, in the um, chat box, uh, put down your first and last name and also put the office that you're in. It would be awesome just because uh, that way I know who's in California and who's from Utah would be awesome. So just if you'll put your first and last name in the office so that I can print that off and have that available to you. So that would be awesome. All right. Well, here's where we're going to start with today is um, I had sent out to those that I had known would uh, were going to be here for sure. I had sent out, uh, or at least I believed, I sent out an email with uh, the business plan on it. So hopefully you all got the business plan. If not, I did share one in the chat box, which I will throw it in there again, even actually, because I know we've had a few people that have just joined. So if you want to print this off or have it available, I'm throwing the, that in the chat box again, is the business plan. Now, the idea of today is I'm going to, we're not going to actually fill out the uh, business plan. The idea of today is for me to get you started on filling it out. So we're going to go through and talk about it and get you ready to rock and roll on that business plan, but not necessarily have you have it all the way totally filled out. Uh, today at the end of the class, but at least you're going to know how to do it and what you need to do in order to get that business plan put together. So um, hopefully you can see it in, in the chat box. It looks like actually we've had a couple more people join and I don't know why, but it won't let you see, I don't think, it before. So I'm going to throw it in one more time here. That business plan. Okay, good. So here's where we're going to get started then with is we talked about yesterday is the company foundation. We went through and we hit on how the very first thing is your purpose, your vision, your why. And you guys heard George, or excuse me, John this morning, even if you listen to Morning Ascent, talking about all of the importance of understanding where you're going. Uh, so uh, yeah, Christine, to answer your question, yes, this is recorded. Uh, and so you can always access any of these. If you go to YouTube and search peak agent training, when you search peak agent training, it will bring up uh, the channel that I have created and all of these videos I keep there on the, uh, the peak agent training channel on YouTube. So yes, always recorded. Uh, every now and then uh, I've had an issue where maybe it didn't record, but uh, but it, yes, they're available there and uh, you can check them out. So, and it's actually the peak agent training, Elena, not um, Century 21 Everest channel. So it's the peak agent training channel. So, all right, here we go. Well, let's get going. I'm excited. We got quite a few people on, so this is good. So here's where we're going to start with this is Robert Kiyosaki wrote a book that was called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And in that book, he talks about the cash flow quadrant. And so we are going to start today by going through and talking about this cash flow quadrant for just a minute, because I need to make sure that you understand a few things with uh, the cash flow quadrant and, and understanding how you need to be operating before we get into the business plan. And then from there, I'm going to share with you a, a story that will help you understand the importance of setting goals and things as well. So here's where we're going to start is is you guys are all exceptional people. Every one of you is an exceptional person. With that being said, though, you are also not an exception to the rules of success. See, there are, are recipes or rules to success. And if you will follow those rules to success, you're going to see success because it is just like following a recipe in terms of making pancakes or some meal, if you'll follow the recipe, you can create that. 
Well, that same thing applies with success. So even though you're an exceptional person, you are not an exception to the rules of success. And so we're going to go through and talk about what that looks like today. But the first thing I wanted to hit on is this from Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. If you have not read that book, I am highly recommending that you should read that book. I got somebody that just joined me in the room. So this is good. Thank you for coming. Let me give you this first. So um, we're going to go through and we're going to be talking about uh, that piece of it here and, and hitting on the importance of understanding some of these things that Robert Kiyosaki talked about. So yesterday I had mentioned to you guys that, um, that Rich Dad, Poor Dad was the name of the book, Carla. So I, I had mentioned to you guys yesterday that I will be pointing out a number of books that would be good for you guys to read. So if you're keeping a list, which actually you're going to see in the business plan that I have given to you guys, you're going to see a list of some things where you can keep track of some books where that, that I would recommend that you read. So Rich Dad Poor Dad is one of those if you have not read it. But in that book, he talks about this cash flow quadrant. And the first area that he talks about in this cash flow quadrant is being an employee, which is where most people will start their, their working career, is they start it as being an employee. And as an employee, how much control do you have over your, um, I'm gonna actually switch out one of my things since I've got Edgar here in the room with me so that I can hear you as well. Um, I hope that didn't mess you guys up on Zoom, did you? You can still hear me? Pierce, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Gotcha. Okay, good. Perfect. Okay. So um, when you become an employee, so you, unfortunately, you're going to get picked on a lot since uh, you're sitting here with me, although I will ask you guys to respond as well. But um, as an employee, how much control do you have over your business and your um, schedule? Not a lot. Yeah, you don't get much control, right? You are told what to do. But that is where most people are going to start their work career, is typically going to start with them being an employee, is what he talks about, which is great, and that's fine. And But the next area that he talks about is that usually people will go from being an employee to becoming self-employed. Now, what's the difference between being an employee and being self-employed? And you don't have to answer everything. I'll, and I'll repeat what they're saying. In fact, actually, what I'll do, this might be a little distracting. But I'll turn this on, the sounds. Ho hopefully, you'll be able to hear them. OK. So. Nobody's going to answer. Well, you have to do everything yourself, I guess. I mean, you have a little more control over your own schedule, but you have, you're, mm -hmm. you have to do everything. Okay. Yeah. So good. Yeah. You have a little bit more control over your schedule, but at the same time, what ends up happening is if that's distracting, just turn it down is yes, you have a little bit more control over your schedule, but also, as a self-employed person, if, it, if it's going to happen, you've got to be the one that goes out and does it to make it happen or otherwise it's not going to happen, right? So that's what he talks about is, it, and, and, and just kind of so that you guys know, if you have not read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, in the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he talks about the, the, the idea behind the premise of the book is he had two dads. He had one dad that uh, was what he would call his rich dad. The other one was what he considered as being his poor dad. And his rich dad was actually what he considered, it was his best friend growing up in Hawaii's dad. And his poor dad was his father who was a school teacher. And good, I love what you're saying, Kyle. I'm gonna come back to that in one second. So um, in terms of this book, he talks about how he learned this then from his rich dad about this. So typically what will happen is people decide they want to become self-employed. Now, let me tell you, for me personally, what happened is I've had my license for 25 years. And so about, I guess, 26 or 27 years ago, I was working at a bank. I oversaw their research and adjustments department. So if you had a problem on your bank account and you went into one of the branches and you said, I've got this issue, whatever it was, they would then call the department that I oversaw, which was the research and adjustments, and they would say, hey, this person said this check should have been for this amount, but it charged for that amount or whatever. 
And we would go and research that. Well, what happened was I was working at the bank and my boss called me in who oversaw the whole operation center, called me into his office and he said, hey, I've got this project for you that I need you to, to take care of. And I said, okay, what is it? And he told me what the project was. And I said, well, I'm a little confused because that project really has nothing to do with my department. Instead, it was this lady by the name of Nancy. I said, that, that really is, is part of what Nancy's department is, which was the returns department, meaning it all return checks and things. And I said, so why are you asking me to do that when really that's Nancy's department? And he's, he responded by saying, well, because I know you'll get it done and I'm not sure that she will. And so at that time for me was what had me kind of go, well, wait a minute. The way that it worked at that bank at that time was essentially they had like these pay grades that were kind of, if you did this job, this was the range of your pay. And you, the longer you did that job, you could get to the upper end of that pay. Well, I had only been a manager for a fairly short time, but Nancy had been at the bank and been a manager for a long time. So, you, so picture, here's where my income was, here's where hers was, and the only difference was the amount of time she had been a manager. Well, my boss is now saying to me, I need you to do this project. And he's saying, well, I know you'll do it, and I'm not sure that she will. And, and I left his office scratching my head a little, kind of going, well, wait a minute, like I'm getting paid this, she's getting paid this, but now I'm doing her job too. So I'm doing my job and hers. Well, that was for me what made me look at saying, okay, I want to go do a job. And, and at the time I was thinking, I want to go be self-employed. I want to go do a job where the harder I work, the more I get paid. Because I always felt like I was this good hard worker at the bank and felt like I did a good job. And so I was like, hey, like, I don't think it's fair that I work hard she apparently doesn't because they didn't want to give her the project. They gave it to me. So I want to go do something where I'm going to get paid according to what I do. So in my mind, I came into real estate because I wanted to be self-employed. Now, after I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, though, this is what I learned, which I don't, I no longer would think of myself as being self-employed. Instead, the next quadrant that he talks about is what he calls a business owner. Now, what would be the difference between a bit between being self-employed and being a business owner? What thoughts do you guys have? Can you still hear that or no? Or do you want me to just repeat it? Wait, repeat it or okay. If they answer, they're not answering me. So, all right. Let's see, Leslie says, having employees as a business owner versus just an independent contractor. Good, thank you. Yes, that is, now here's the interesting thing actually, Leslie, on this. Every time I teach this class and I ask that question, that is the response that I usually get is that a business owner has employees. Now, here's the next question for you is, which, so let's see, Carla's saying you have a plan, goals more established, good, I like that. Kyle says you have own a process and replicable outcomes. Yes, good. I love it. So um, wh why, let me, here's the next question though for you guys. Why do we assume that a business owner has employees and we assume a self-employed does not? And you guys can unmute. I'm I'm fine if you. I mean, I'm fine with you type in the chat box too. But. I think a self-employed guy is more working in his business. He, he's almost an. I mean, he serves as an employee of it almost, whereas a business owner is that term. You know, kind of working on the business more than in it. Um, okay. Building systems and processes and. Okay, so, so ultimately what you're saying is the difference is this one is working in the business, this one works on the business. Okay, good, I like it. Uh, let's see, Batsuk says uh, tax difference and you have your own time frame and dedicate you for yourself or responsible. You're building an asset and a business to help you create wealth, that's good. Yeah, good, I like where you guys are going with this. Is ultimately, so here's for you guys, what I want you to look at it is from today forward. So going forward from today, no longer should you think of yourself as being self-employed. Now, like I said, when I first came into real estate, my thought was I want to go be self-employed. I want to be able to 
decide my income based upon how much money I, or how hard I work and all those kinds of things. Well, I now understand though, that for me, I would say, and there's more to it than what you guys have even said, but to me, being self-employed, here's how, let me kind of give you this as the example, I guess, that I would say in terms of the difference is right out of high school, I worked for two different guys doing construction. And the first guy that I worked for, I would look at him today and I would classify him as being a business owner. So right out of high school, I went to work for a guy that I was doing construction where what we were doing is we would either go on and do some remodels in people's houses. We would build uh, most of what it seemed like we ended up doing was building garages, you know, detached garages for people. Um, but we would put new roofs on houses, stuff like that. Well, that guy just looking back now at the time, right out of high school, I didn't get this, but now today I could look at it and say he was a business owner. And, and looking back at what has happened over that time, where he is in his career today, I would tell you, he approached it as a business owner. Well, not long after that, I ended up working for another guy that this guy actually was my uh, scout leader from when I was in the Boy Scouts. And he had been my scout leader and I went to him and, and he was doing construction and I said, hey, I've done some, I wanna work with you. So he gave me a job and we were working this. now. What ended up happening though, it was the week, I can't remember if it was the week before Christmas or after now, but either way, it doesn't matter. But I went to, to work the one day and he said, hey, we're gonna finish up this job today. And I said, great, what are we doing next? And he said, uh, I don't have any work. So as a result, like you probably ought to go find a job because I don't have anything else coming up and I don't know when the next job's gonna show up. See, here was the difference. The first guy that I worked for consistently was working on getting more jobs and we were consistently busy. This other guy who I would look at today and tell you, he, I would classify, put him in the self-employed and the other in the business owner. It, and the only difference that I would say between the two was, is one had a plan, the other one had no plan. The, the second guy that I worked for, it was a matter of just, hey, if a job shows up, then we got it, we'll go do it. And if it doesn't, then I don't know what we're gonna do. And, and here's part of the other thing that's the difference I would say is this second guy had a wife who was a nurse. And so to some extent, I'm not sure that he needed a ton of money to be made. Sorry, my nose is, uh, I feel like it's dripping here. All right. So I don't feel like he needed to make money. It was kind of just whatever he could get was fine, but he also needed someone to help him along the way. So here's what I guess I'm getting at for you guys. From today forward, do not look at yourself anymore as a self-employed person if you have. Instead, I want you to look at yourself as a business owner. And the biggest difference between a business owner and a self-employed person is this. The business owner has a plan. I like the way Kelly said it is they work on the business, not just in the business as well. And that's how you need to be as an agent is so from today forward, do not look at yourself as I'm a business owner or excuse me, as self-employed, I am a business owner. Now, I think the reason we think about the uh, business owner as having employees is because ultimately nobody says it this way, but we think of it as a business owner as being successful. And we think of the self-employed as the guy who just kind of works for himself and, and scrapes by. Is, at least that's how I think about it. Kyle said it as a business can be sold. And I would agree with that. Is, and I love the way you said it. Is Self-employed people are the business. That is so good. So, so good. Because that is exactly right. So we want to build a business. Now, here's the thing that I will tell you. If you listen to George, I think it was yesterday at Morning Ascent. He talked about building a business that you can sell. I have not seen that very often in real estate. In my 25 years, I have seen very few agents that have built a business that they could actually turn around and sell as an individual agent. But here's what I will tell you though, is I have seen it a couple of times where somebody has done that. And I will tell you, it takes you building this as a business in order for you to be able to do that. So we want to approach it as a business. Now, let me speak to this uh, from the next point of view on this. In terms of being self-employed versus being a business owner, somebody earlier up above in the chat box, and I don't remember who it was, so uh, forgive me, but 
is there are different tax advantages as well. Now, this is the point, especially since we've got a bunch of California agents on and California is a little bit of a litigious state. So as a result of that, to, to, to protect myself, I have to say to you guys, do not rely on what I'm about to tell you. Talk to an accountant or an attorney to get this set up. But here's what I will tell you from my own experience. Now, remember, I told you the story of I left the bank to come into real estate. I have shared with you guys, some of you, but I will share with the rest of you tomorrow more details of this. But after I had been in the business about two years, the business really took off for me. Like my income went up dramatically. And as a result of that, I had gone to get my taxes done from a guy that, that again, actually, as I think about it, he was a self-employed accountant, not a business owner accountant meaning the same kind of a thing. He wasn't very professional. He wasn't really building a business. He just did taxes for people essentially. Well, I went to get my taxes done with from him the one year and I showed up and I asked him, I said, should I go and get myself set up as an S corp? And he said, oh no, I don't think you need to do that. And I said, okay. And so I didn't. The next year though, my business doubled. And I went in to get my taxes done and I sat down with this guy, his name was Roger, sat down with Roger and Roger said to me, you know what we ought to do? We ought to look at you setting yourself up as, as a corporation. And I said, well, I asked you that last year and you told me no. And he said, well, I didn't realize you were gonna have your income go up that much. And I said, well, isn't that the idea? Like is every year that you should make more money? I was like, I thought that was whole, the whole point of this and and my intention is to continue to do that and he said oh well then yeah i mean we should have set that up well i was pretty frustrated at that point so i went back to the office and i started asking around and i asked an agent that was a friend of mine like who do you go to for your taxes and he told me so i went and called up this guy i went and showed up to him and sat down and he looked through it and he said if i had done your taxes I, you would have paid ten thousand dollars less in taxes than what you're going you are owe this year, and I was like, oh, like huge mistake. So here's what I guess I'm saying to you: the difference was he had me get set up as a corporation. So talk to an attorney or an accountant, a CPA, somebody, and find out for you what is going to be the best structure for you to get set up at. Is, is it an LLC? Is it an S corp? You know, what is it that they want to set you up at? But here's what I will tell you that I have learned over my years of this. There are huge tax advantages to being a business owner versus being self-employed. Now, regardless of which side of the aisle you sit on in terms of politics, and I don't, it doesn't really matter, but where do they get their money, the politicians? Well, I not see. taxes. Well, uh -huh. yeah, no, yeah, no, no, no. I mean them personally to fund their campaigns. Where does the money come from? Oh, that doesn't business. come from taxes. Donations? Yeah, from big businesses, right? They get donations, yes, from businesses typically. So I don't care which side of the aisle you're on. The businesses are typically the ones that are funding it. So when those guys make it to Capitol Hill, guess who they're friendly to in terms of the laws and things that they create when it comes to taxes? The businesses. See, so it's to our advantage to be set up as a business. And, and so not only when I say treat yourself from today forward as being a business owner, yes, we want to do that. But part of why we want to do that is because of the tax advantages that that's going to bring to you. Now, I know for you guys in California, maybe it won't matter as much because from my understanding is, which by the way, I get to pay taxes in California this year a little bit. So I get to find out because part of my income this year uh, came from the California offices. So I get to uh, pay California state tax. So I'm looking forward to this because what I understand is what they give you is the tax form. It just has two lines. How much did you make? And you put in the amount and then send that, this amount in, C line one. So you just send in everything you make. So I'm looking forward to sending in everything I made this year from California into uh, the state of California to Governor Newsom, who I do not like right now, FYI. Really mad at him because he won't open Disneyland and I want to go to Disneyland. So don't re-vote for Governor Newsom. Deal?
I'm just kidding. I don't really it care. It is Go not through. the happiest place on <laughs> earth, Raj. I know. Not right now. I, 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 when it's open, I've been a number of times, and it is not my happy place, that's for sure. Oh, I love it. So I'm, re- I'm, I'm dying that I can't go right now. So anyway. All right. So yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to vote against Governor Newsom. I don't care who runs, just whoever will open Disneyland. All right. So from today forward, you're a business owner. So that's how you want to do it. And find out from, you know, talk to a CPA or an attorney, whoever you need to, to find out what do I need to do? And does it make sense for me to set this up as a business owner? Because here's the thing. I will tell you, like, there are so many things that you can write off as a business owner that you can't as a self-employed. It is so much to your advantage to be able to do that. So uh, Kyle said, and don't move to Utah and vote the same way. (laughs) Yeah, we don't want Governor Newsom in Utah. All right. So that's the business owner. Now, the next thing that he talks about, which we're not going to spend as much time on this, but the fourth quadrant that uh, Robert Kiyosaki talks about is the investor quadrant. The idea, hopefully for you, based on what we talked about yesterday, so tying in what our class yesterday we talked about is your purpose, your vision, your why, is once you understand that, and we talked about typically it's not going to be about making money from real estate. It's making that money to go do something else. Well, the idea then is as we make the money in this as a business owner, we should be working towards becoming an investor. Now, I'm going to talk to you about how to do that in just a minute. But what I want to make sure you guys understand is hopefully you came into this business to make money. And as a result of coming into this business to make money, I've also watched over my 25 years and guilty of it early on as well, where you go make a bunch of money. But guess what? It is easy to spend a lot of money. Like we talked about yesterday, I had asked you guys what typically happens to the people who end up um, winning the lottery, they end up broke. Well, guess what? It's easy to spend a lot of money. And so if you don't have a plan in place, you could go in this business and make three, four, five hundred thousand dollars seven hundred 500000 a million. Or Pierce said yesterday he's going to make $3 million. Guess what? You could spend all $3 million of that in no problem at all in an instant if you don't have a plan in place. So you need to create a plan that, hey, part of what I want to do from this business in real estate is to become this investor. Now, we've got a number of agents who are good examples of this. Um, The one that always comes to my mind first from Utah, his name is Phil Harvey. Phil Harvey, since the um, Great Recession, so since 2008, he has built so what in 12 years but he did it in in about eight years or nine he has built a to the point that he is now an investor he has enough properties that he owns over the last 10 years that he has paid off and gotten things going to where his net cash flow so to him net every month is twenty three thousand dollars and actually maybe more than that now it's been a couple years since i heard him say this But it was $23,000 a month is what he has coming into him just from his investments that he owns. See, and and actually what he did two years ago in July, so two years ago in July, he had built it to this point. What he did is, and he has fairly young kids too, but so two years ago in July, he went and bought a motorhome. He took his kids out of school for a year and he decided he was going to travel the United States. And rather than his kids reading about history, he went and showed them history. He drove the United States showing them what it looked like. Now, he could afford to do that because he has become an investor. He has built his real estate career to the point that he has $23,000 or two years ago had $23,000. It may be thirty now. I don't know. But $23,000 a month that just comes in if he doesn't sell a property. Now, while he was out doing that, he continued to sell properties and to help people. And a lot of what his real estate career looks like today is he is out training people how to become this investor. See, that's how what we, our approach needs to be is from today forward, we're now a business owner, but we're working to become this investor. And you can do it if you will actually follow the steps and things that we're going to talk about next. Okay. So, 
actually, I got one other thing I'm going to do first. And then actually, the, the thing that he's added now to this, he's added kind of a fifth area to this cash flow quadrant. So it's not really a quadrant anymore. But is, and that is to become a philanthropist. See, ultimately, we become the investor, hopefully continue to build money coming in to the point that you get to where a uh, Bill Gates is or some of these guys that are now Bill Gates' job is to just go give away his money is kind of what he's doing. Or if you look at, um, uh, shoot, what's his name now? The steel guy, Carnegie. What was his first name? I keep wanting to Andrew. say Dale Carnegie. Andrew, Andrew, thank you. I kept wanting to say Dale, but I'm like, I, Dale Carnegie was not that. Andrew Carnegie, yeah. His, his goal in life was to amass a fortune, which he did. And then the second half of his life was to get, give it all away. So ultimately, after we become this investor is then to be this philanthropist probably is where we want to be, get to, is that we've built this fortune that now we're going to now go and give it away. All right, so we're going to talk about how to do that. So let me uh, spend a few minutes next on, on how we're going to do that. So on the business plan, which I, looks like we've had a, a few more people join. So let me share that business plan one more time in the chat box. So make sure everyone has it. But on this uh, business plan, you will notice here, and I'll hold it up to where you guys can kind of see here. But the first thing on there it shows is your, where you're going to put in your total commissions earned. Well, on this total commissions earned, I, I had said to you guys yesterday, what would be helpful is if you could come with a, a little bit of a plan of like, how much money do you need on a monthly basis? So let me make sure you guys can see still here where I'm writing, which you can. Okay. So the next thing here is how much money do you need just on a monthly basis? Now, you don't have to answer me that, but hopefully you have that written down. So before we ever write in a number here on this business plan for the total commissions or what our goal is going to be, the first thing we got to do is get into some detail on that. So the first thing is, how much money do you need just on a weekly or a monthly basis or an annual basis, whatever that is. So figure out what that's going to look like. And, and I would say to probably do it on a monthly basis, but figure out like what, how much money do you need just on a monthly basis. So now that you have that written down, now then the next step, step is that what we want to look at is, do you have any debts that you want to pay off? That's the next thing that I say is, so as you, before we write down what our goal is in terms of a commission's earned, the next thing we want to do is we want to have written down in here of, okay, here's how much money I just have to have to just survive. So like that's just at a bare minimum, this is what I need to pay my bills and to keep my credit score good. Then you can say from there, okay, do you have some debts that you want to pay off? Do you have a car that you want to? Do you have credit cards that you want to pay off? Student loans? Like whatever it is, how much of your debt do you want to pay off in the next year? And then just decide on a number and put it down there. Now, if you have none, congratulations, good for you. But if you do have some, how much of it do you want to eliminate? Is it a house that you want, a mortgage that you want to eliminate? Like whatever it is, how much debt do you want to eliminate and decide what that is and then write it down. Next. I'm going to just write it down as like things here. What things do you want to buy? Are there some things that you want to buy in the next year? Maybe a new car, you know, a, maybe it is a new house, but maybe it is a uh, new wardrobe. I don't know, whatever it is, decide what do you want to buy and then write it down. Now, in terms of when I say this, decide what it is and write it down. If you want to buy a new car, don't just go look up online and be like, okay, this is the car that I want and this is about how much it's going to be. No, go down to the dealership, get in a car, go drive it, look at the options that you want to have, figure out what options you want and then write down how much that's going to cost. That's how we want to approach this. Okay, next. I'm writing this one down as vacation slash trips. Now, let me ask you guys, do you know what the difference is between a vacation and a trip? What's the difference between a vacation and a trip? The extra spending money you have. Okay, good. I like your thinking on that, Aaron. That's good. 
Marissa said uh, relaxation. One involves drugs. Okay, interesting. A trip has a bigger impact on your life. Okay, maybe. Vacation is all relaxing. Yeah, here's what the difference is, FYI. A vacation has no kids with it. The trips, you take the kids with you. <laughs> that's the, so totally a joke, but sort of. For my wife and I, that's how we define it. Should we go on a trip? That means the kids are going. If we're going on a vacation, the kids aren't going. So that's the difference for me. So you guys can call it whatever you want, how you want to call it. But decide what vacations or trips you're going to go on in the next year. Now, same thing with this is what you want to do with this is don't just say, for example, well, we want to go on a cruise. Okay, but you got to get more detail than that. Instead, what you got to say is where are you going to go on the cruise? Where, what, what port are you going to leave from? Where are you going to go to while you're on the cruise? What, probably I shouldn't be talking about cruises, right? They're probably not happening for a while, I'm guessing, right? No cruises are probably, but anyway, that's the one example I started. So we're continuing. What excursions are you going to do on it? Like what I want you to do on this is to figure out exactly what it's going to cost. Meaning, are you going to fly there in first class or are you going to sit in the back of the plane? If that's the case, then figure out how much it's going to cost to go first class. So go price exactly what it's going to cost. See, what I want you to do is actually go plan this vacation or this trip and then figure out exactly how much it's going to cost. How much do you want for spending money? Somebody said how much money you spend and things. How much money do you want to spend? Where do you want to eat? What do you want to do on this trip? Plan the trip. Now, let me tell you quickly a story about this. I had an agent that was sitting. So I have been here at Everest now a little over two years. So this was two years. No, two years, five years. What am I talking about? I've been here five years. I don't know where two years came from. So this is the story I'm telling you is a little over five years old because I started doing the trainings in August. So this would have been August five years ago. I had an agent that was in the, um, the class, this class that I was teaching. And, she, and I was saying, said this exact thing about planning a trip or a vacation and actually go plan it. Well, this agent raises her hand and she, she got a little bit emotional. And she said, I have never taken my kids on a vacation is what she said. Now I would have called it a trip, but she said, I've never taken my kids on a vacation. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, cause this lady was probably mid fifties to late fifties. And she said, my kids are grown, but we never went on a vacation. And I was like, what do you mean you never went on a vacation? Like, I just couldn't fathom that. And she said, well, I mean, like we did little like camping trips. We would go camping or something up in the mountains, but she said, I never really took my kids anywhere on a vacation, and I would just love to do that. So I told her this, what I'm telling you guys right now. I said, great, decide what that is. I want you to go plan it and actually plan, figure out how many hotel rooms are you going to need if you're going to take your kids? How much is the airfare going to be to take your kids and your grandkids? What are you going to, and, and where she said she wanted to take them was to Disney World in Florida. So she said, I want to go do that. I said, great. Figure out how much the airfare is going to cost. Figure out how much the hotel is going to cost for you to, to put up your kids and things. Figure out how much the passes are going to cost at Disney World. Figure out, are you paying for the food or the kids? And if you are, how much is it going to cost for the food? Like plan this whole thing out. So she planned it out. And she actually went and did this and planned it out. So I know where the two years thing came from. Two years after that, she came to me and said that she had done it. She took her family, her kids and her grandkids, paid for their flight, paid for their hotel, paid for their Disney World tickets, all of those things. She did it. And, and, and when I told you she was emotional when she first brought up, she had never brought them on vacation. When she grabbed me and told me, hey, last month we came back from that trip and did it. She had a definite tear coming down her cheek as she told me about it because she was able to do it. So here's the thing. When I'm saying this, that's the detail you need to do it. So that's part of why I said to you, we're not going to be able to fully do this business plan today because you got some homework you got to do. You got to go back and look at what are the trips or vacations? What are the things that I want to buy and know exactly what it is? Then you can put the, that dollar amount down there. All right, next. The next thing is um, 
I'm going to put down here is I'm going to say it as savings. Okay. So remember our part of what we're talking about here is we want to become this investor. The way that that's going to happen is you got to start putting money aside. Now, another book that if you have not read that I would recommend for you guys is it's called uh, the richest man in Babylon. And it was written by Og Mandino. So the richest man in Babylon. In that book, he talks about this theory that I'm going to share with you guys right now. So now, to some extent, how I'm going to share this with you doesn't fully apply to us in real estate because we don't have a set income. So, th so just know that in this book, what he talks about, which is a great theory, doesn't fully apply to us in real estate necessarily because of this. What he said is that this part of our income should be not more than 70%. So you, we, you should learn to live off of 70% of your income is, is what he says we should do. Now, ultimately, like I said, for us in real estate, we, we control our income in a lot of ways. And so as a result of that, it's a little bit different for us, but meaning let's just say you had a job that you made $70,000 a year or $100,000 a year, he's saying you should live off of $70,000 of that. And then the other 30% should be going into a, it, well, not fully savings, but let me show you what it looks like. Is Here's what he said. So of this 30%, 10% should be going to charity. So you should be donating 10% of your income to some charity. You decide what that looks like. And, you know, is it uh, a church? Is it uh, United Way? Um, is it, you know, some organization? You figure out what it is. But, yeah, for Kyle, he's going to save the bees. So donate to save the bees. That works. Okay? And, and I'm assuming you mean the Salt Lake Bees, the baseball team. No, joking. All right. So 10% to charity. So, and the reason for that is, is you should be giving back. If you are going to be reaping these rewards and seeing this success, you need to be sharing and giving back to those who are less fortunate. So 10%, he said, should go to charity. The next 10% of this 30% should go to passive investing. What would be passive investing? Even though I'm looking at you, you don't have to answer. Stocks. Oh, sorry. Two people talking at the same time. Do it again. Stocks. stocks. Oh, you both said stocks too. That was good. Okay, good. Yeah, so okay, good. Stocks could be passive investing. What else would be? Uh, real estate certainly could be. Okay, good. Kyle said funding startups, okay. An IRA, good cat. Yeah, ultimately, here's how I want you to think about it, is basically think of it this way. And in fact, actually, let me, I'm gonna back you into it. When, yeah, Julie said life insurance, that's great. Where, when people go buy a house, and, and I don't know the answer to this, but what percentage of the people that go buy a house get a loan? Just guessing, guesstimating. 90. I'd say it's up in the 90%. Yeah, so I, I'm hearing 90%. What'd you say, Andrew? And you're saying 80. Yeah, I would guess it's in the 80, 90%. I think you guys are right on. It is probably in that ballpark. So, okay, so now the people who get a loan, where do they get that money from? Banks. Okay, and where does the bank get the money from? Depository. Investors. Yeah, see, ultimately that's, so part of what I say to you guys, we need to put 10% of our money into passive investing. Passive investing is somebody else is managing the money. You're not managing it. You're letting someone else manage that money. So the idea of that is tied to, especially for us in real estate, is we wanna have people be able to get loans. If money is available for them to get loans with, it's gonna be cheaper to get that money. Well, so as a result, we need to do our part of helping that and in helping the economy is probably the better way of saying it, helping keep the economy going. So that's passive investing. The other 10% of this 30% should be for active investing. So what would be active investing then? Yeah. 
in, in yourself, maybe? Say that again, Jesse? In yourself, maybe? Okay, good, yeah. A, a business that you're running actively, maybe? Um, could be real estate if you're managing it, I guess, if you take a real active interest in it. Okay, good. Here's the other thing that I would say. So think of it this way. Is active investing is you're going to be actively involved in it. So here's what I would say. So Kyle said day trading. That could be a good example of, day, of active investing. The other that I would say for us, since we're in real estate, is you are going to come across properties that could be a good deal. When you come across that really good deal, you should buy it. And in the event you're not to that point yet that you can buy it, then you should call me and I'll buy it. I'll even let you represent me and be my agent to purchase that property. But that's part of what you want to do is actually you should be the actively investing. See, you should be building this account, this savings account to where you can, when you come across the good deal, you can say, yeah, I'll buy it. But in the meantime, until you're there, you call me and, and I'll let you represent me on the deal, but I'm going to buy the property. So that's part of where we want to get to with this, okay, is so that we can become this investor. So here's what should happen now. So let me draw a line down here. What we want to do then for this, on this total commissions earned, what we want to do is this, is we want to figure out what all of this is, and then that is going to be 70% of, of our income. So then in addition to that, we need an additional 30% so that we can pay to charity, do some passive investing and some active investing. And then that's the number that we want to write down as our goal in terms of commissions that we want to earn. So hopefully that makes sense for you guys and, and is a little bit different approach maybe than, because see, here's the thing. The way most people approach it is they go, and I asked you guys yesterday how much you wanted to make. And a bunch of you guys, you know, 100,000, 130,000, 250, you know, 300, whatever it is. See, that didn't mean anything. And most of you, I would be willing to bet, did not take the time to actually think it through like this to calculate, hey, here's, what, here's exactly how much I need for my monthly. Here's how much I'm going to eliminate debt. Here's some things I want to buy, vacations and trips I want to go on. And here's how much I'm going to save. Because here's the thing, when you do this and you add it up, what do you think the chances are it equals 130,000? Probably not, right? It's probably going to be some round weird number. That's the number I want you guys to write in here. When you write it down in here, like I guess you technically could round it up. Maybe, maybe whoever said 250,000 yesterday, maybe it was really $248,562 and they just rounded it up to 250. But I'm gonna invite you not to do that. Instead, after today, if anybody ever asks you what your goal in, is in terms of income, I want you to say it as $248,562, if that's what it is. And, and why? Why do I want you to do it that way? It makes it more specific and more willing to reach it. That's right. Is, that is exactly right. Is what is, happens by you doing it that is every one of those dollars means something. And when you say it that way, more than likely, somebody's going to ask you, like, why, why wouldn't you just round it to 250? Or why did you say 248, what, whatever the number was that I used, used 248,562. Like, well, why, why $62? And they may say, why $2? Well, that $2 means something in here. That's why we want it to be that way. It, the more specific you can be on this, the more likely you're going to hit the goal. All right, next thing. All right, so what we're going to do, in fact, let me just, uh, looks like we may have had a p person or two more join. Let me throw the business plan one more time in the chat box so that hopefully everybody's got one. All right, so what, what we're going to do then is I'm going to kind of walk you guys through this business plan to help you understand um, how to fill it out. So your, your homework is going to be to go fill it out. The first step is to go through and do this. And here's what I'm telling you guys. I promise you, if you will take the time to do this, if you will really take the time to calculate all this out and figure out like what are the trips and vacations and the things I want to buy and how much debt 
if you will take the time to do that and then come up with the number, I'm telling you, it gets it, it sinks it into the unconscious in a way that just throwing out, well, I want to make $250,000. Do, that doesn't well, get there. Yeah, go ahead. I just drove a brand new Subaru two days ago. And I know this, I know the exact price, which I never really did. But now that I know it, it's everything I think about because I actually drove, sat in the car, and I can remember it as clear as day. And it's all I think about. So it just concretes in your wants. Perfect. That's exactly right. Thanks, Carla. Did you, could you hear her? On there? Okay. So yeah, just cements it is basically what she was saying. So yeah, that's hey, awesome. Russ? So thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. We're not seeing the form you put in the chat box. So you're not seeing it in the chat box? No. Yeah, I, I can't see it either. Okay. Well, let's do this then. I'm going to try one more Can you email time. it to us? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So here, here's what I want you to do. Just to remind me, um, throw in your email in the chat box and then it's there, I'll go I through. See it. It's there. Yeah, it's I gonna see say it. it. Yeah. I don't know. It should just be somewhere in there. I don't know why it's not showing up for you guys, but um, you have to download. Maybe, maybe it's because I'm on my phone. I don't know. Could be that maybe it is because you're on your phone. Just if you'll put your email address in the chat box after the class, I will send, I'll get it this afternoon sent out to you so that you have one. So, okay. Thank you. And uh, Julie's asking, how do you send investment properties to me that you find? You call me and tell me about it. And, uh, and then I'll decide if it's a deal or not. So, yeah. So just call me when you come across one, call me and go, Hey Russ, I found a, a deal. I'll give you an example. I've got one. I'm going to go look at tomorrow actually that an agent was out door knocking in um, just up the street here from the office and came across the property that the owner's like, yeah, I want to sell it, but the buyer's going to have to tear the place down, which my guess is that won't have to happen. So, uh, so Julie, just in Utah, not necessarily. Um, I don't know the California market as well. I was coming down there every six weeks, but since March, for some reason, I haven't been able to come down there. So uh, hopefully that'll come back soon. But no, yeah, let me know about it in California as well. That'd be awesome. All right, cool. Yeah, I'll send that out to you guys. All right, so um, actually next thing that I'm gonna do then, since we have so many that don't have the business plan, let me do, I'm gonna do one other thing. So let me erase this for a second. All right, so I want to share actually with you guys, the, there are seven things, I wasn't sure if I was going to do this, but I'm going to do this. There are seven things that you need to have as you put together a business plan and as you set goals. So we're going to talk about goal setting for a minute. And then, and then um, since so many are missing the, uh, the documents, um, I'll kind of run through it, but I'm going to do it a little quicker. Instead, I'm going to spend a little more time on this instead. So uh, there are seven things that you need to make sure that you are doing and you need to be prepared for when you are setting goals. So I want to talk about those, those seven things with you, okay? So the first one is it has to be written down. So the number one thing that when you are goal setting is you've got to write it down. So when we just talked about how the process of going through before you write it down, but you got to make sure that you write it down. Now, let me, I'm going to give you a, a story here real quick as I give you these seven things. So um, World War II, what, what, what happened in World War II? And, and, I, and I know there's a lot of things that happened, but just like, what are some things that took place? War, obviously, uh, a lot of, a lot of, uh, Men gone from this country. Um, booby, boober, bo baby boomer thing afterwards. Okay. Um, well, let me ask it this way: What did Japan Japan do to us? Bombed us, attacked Where? us, Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. So then, what did we do? Joined the war. You kind of you cut out there, Pierce. Say it again. Uh, we went back to war and we nuked them. Yeah, we dropped a couple of atomic bombs on Japan, right? Yep. Which basically ended the war, right? So as a result of us doing that, though, now, so I want to talk about Japan for a minute. So keep in mind, we dropped two atomic bombs in Japan that basically decimates them. 
Well, so what happened though, is they decided that in 1950, what, what happened is, well, in the forties, they were, were doing textile cloth. Well, they decided that they wanted in the 1940s that they wanted to be the number one producer of steel. Now, why, why do you think they would want to become the number one producer of steel? What was going on in the U.S. in the 50s? Steel. Production of cars and industrialization and stuff like that. That's right. So all of a sudden, we're, we're building all these cars, building all these buildings. Japan says, we're going to become the number one producer of steel. Now, what do you need to produce steel? Iron. Iron ore. Good. We need iron ore. What else? And coal. Kyle said coal. Good. You need iron ore and you need coal. Now, what is Japan? It's an island. Limited right? resources. Yeah. Yeah. They're limited on their resources, right? So Japan's an island. They don't have iron ore. I'm assuming they probably didn't have coal either. So, but they want to be, become the number one producer of steel. So the first thing they did though, is they wrote down their goal. We want to be the number one producer of steel. So they wrote it down. The number two thing that you have to do when you're going to, when you're going to set goals is put a time frame to it. So number two is there's got to be a time frame associated with it, with the goal that you're going to set. Well, see, they said by 1950, they, they wanted to be the number one producer of steel. So this is right after World War II, they decide we want to be the number one producer of steel. And then they said by 1950, so they had written it down. Number three then. Number three thing to goal setting is identify challenges. Well, we just talked about what they identified as their challenge. They didn't have any iron ore, they didn't have coal, so they're gonna to have to import it in order for them to do that. Well, so that now that they have done that, then the number four thing that we do after we have to identify our challenge is come up with some solutions. So we have to identify solutions. So I gotta come up with what are the solutions to those challenges? Because guess what? You're going to, as you set the goals, so, I'm going to pick on Pierce because yesterday he said he wants to make $3 million a year, which is great. I, I'm all for it. But there's probably going to be some challenges for you for that. And so you got to identify what are those challenges that I'm going to have to do. And then number two is what are the solutions then to those challenges? If you're going to have that challenge, what's the solution going to be? So for Japan, they decided we're going to have to import the iron ore. We're going to have to import the steel in order to do that, all right? Now, here's what they did. So they did, they imported the iron ore, they imported the coal. By, the, by 1950, they were the number one producer of steel. Guess who they were selling the steel to? The yeah. US. And, and what were we using it for? Somebody already said, to build cars. So guess what Japan decided they wanted to do their next goal? By 1960, they wanted to be the number one producer of cars. They decided we want to produce cars. Well, so then they did the same process. By 1960, we want to be producing cars. What are the challenges that we have for it? And then what are the solutions? And they went to work. By 1960, they were producing cars. Then after that, they decided that by 1970, they wanted to be the number one producer of electronics. So guess what? They went to work on producing electronics. So that by the 70s and 80s, they, they were the number one producer of the electronics. See, this is all they did was follow this process of you got to write it down. You got to have a time frame, identify your challenges and identify your solutions. Now, the next thing for you guys that you need to write down that you need to do is W-I-I-F-M. I'm putting the acronym, which stands for what's in it for me. You got to figure out What's in it for you? What is the advantage if you take the time to, to do this? What is it going to do for you in terms of you being able to accomplish this? What's the benefit going to be? So what's in it for me? As you identify that, 
then you're going to be able to more likely accomplish it. That was my idea over here that I've erased of figuring out exactly what's that car like to drive? What does it feel like when we go on that vacation? And where are we gonna go? And all those kinds of things, okay? So what's in it for me? Number six then is create a schedule or, ULE, sorry, schedule or a plan to do it. You gotta put together the plan or write out a schedule. So we're gonna talk about that today for you guys for a schedule as well. And then number seven is basically hard work. You're just gonna to have to get to work on it. Those are the seven things that you need to take into account when you're setting goals. Is have I written it down? Have I put a time frame to it? Have I identified the challenges? Have I come up with solutions? Do I know why I wanna do it basically, the what's in it for me? Have I created a plan or a schedule to do it and then get to work on it? Those are the seven things that you need to do. All right, with that, so now let's go through and we'll talk about this. I see that um, Brea tried to sh sh do a screenshot. Did that work for you guys to be able to see the business plan or no? You have to share it. I think she did, but I don't know. Anyway, I'll, I'm gonna email it to you guys, so don't worry about it. All right. Um, as we go through this, so the first thing on there is total commissions earned. The next line over there is average commission. So essentially what you're gonna do is this. Let's just say that I had come up with that 248,562, okay? So essentially, if let's just say for the ease of numbers that my average commission was going to be $10,000. And the reason I'm saying it that way is we've got California that maybe it's a little higher than that. Utah's a little bit lower. Utah's somewhere in the 7,000, I think, average commission. I think California might be 12. But for the ease of numbers, let's just say that my average commission is 10,000. And, and we could even say it as 5,000 is fine. But let's just do it as 10,000. If I want to make $248,562 and my average commission is $10,000, how many transactions am I going to have to do? This is why I did it this way to make the math easy. 25. Yeah, essentially, I'm going to have to do 25 transactions to make that $248,000, right? So ultimately, what you want to do is figure out for you. So if it was 5,000, if my average commission was gonna be 5,000, well, now I gotta do 50 transactions. But now that I know how many transactions I need to do, now I can look at the next line on here, which the next thing that we're gonna talk about on here, I'm gonna skip over the business expenses because here's the challenge with coming up with that for on a business plan in terms of the business expenses. The challenge with coming up with that is based on it depends on if you are set up as a business or not if you're set up as a business you're going to pay a lot less taxes we as we already talked about and for me the hard part is my actual business expenses are very very low but as far as the irs is concerned they're really really high so that's the challenge of this so so let's just say total transactions closed actually let me before i do that if you're wanting to figure out, well, how much should I do on the business expenses, the percentage of the income? If you did 20%, you're gonna be great. Like that's a lot. So you should be fine though on business expenses. All right, so total transactions closed. I'm gonna say that it was 25 was the number that I came up with. Well, whatever it is for you, you're gonna come up with that. Now that I've come up with that, how many of those are gonna be buyers or sellers? So if we've got 25, how many of them are buyers and how many of them are sellers? Well, here's what I will tell you. If you have been in the business for a year or two, you should be able to go back and look at your past transactions and figure out what percentage were buyers and what were sellers. So that's how you're going to figure out. Once you know what the percentage is, now I could look at this and say, okay, here's what the percentage is. If you're new to the business though, here's what I'm going to tell you is you are probably most likely and, and, and the, I understand there's always exceptions to the rule, but most likely you're going to be buyer heavy if you are new to the business. You're probably going to do more buyers than sellers. Now, again, that's not always the case, but I would say the majority of the time you're going to start out being buyer heavy, meaning if it's your first year in the business and you're saying you're going to do 25, it is very likely 
that you could be somewhere in the 18 to 20 buyers for five sellers or seven sellers somewhere, you know, that 18 to 20, at, which means five to seven, probably sellers. Now you're going to want to work towards becoming that. So think of it this way. I know the screen you guys can see me on is, is very small, but think of it this way. If over here is the buyer side and over here is the seller side, you're going to start out being very, very buyer heavy. And over time in your career, you're going to slowly swing that pendulum to, be, to where you end up being more likely heavy on the seller side. But to begin with, you're probably going to be heavier on the buyer side. And I usually say, think of it as you're probably going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 70% buyers to 30% being sellers. Now that's going to be dependent on where, what areas you're working. And we'll talk about that tomorrow of ways that you can get more listings. So tomorrow we'll talk about that in the class, but just know you're probably going to be 70% buyers to begin with the 30% sellers in the beginning may even be more like an 80, 20, even kind of a thing, but just know that's typically the way it's going to work. Now it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but it kind of does. Meaning that typically what I have seen is that people will tend to be more likely to use you if you're, if you're a newer agent to buy a house, they won't use you to sell their houses. They're usually more tentative to use you to sell their house, which is kind of ironic because we use the same contract either way. Like it's kind of weird, but for whatever reason, just know that's what tends to happen is a buyer, if you're a new agent, buyers are going to trust you more than a seller will. So you're probably going to be heavier on the buyer side. So I would say calculate it. And if you're not sure, put it as a 70-30, buyers, 30% sellers. But then every year that you're in the business, you should be seeing that, like I said, go from being heavier on the buyer side to probably heavier on the list side. Okay. All right. Total days work. Ideal thing would be to sit down with a calendar and figure out what days you're taking off. Remember, we already talked about your trips and vacations. You should already have that plan. So you should be able to look at it and say, these are the days that I'm going to work. And are you going to work five days a week, six days a week? What's that going to look like? I have a personal just belief. And part of this personal belief, though, comes from training agents for 15 years. You need to take one day off. I don't care what day it is but schedule a day off every single week that you do not do real estate. Find somebody that you can partner up with. That, so I've got Edgar here in the room with me that I could say, okay, I'm taking off on Fridays. I'm not gonna work at all on Fridays. I'm gonna forward my phone to you on Fridays. What day are you gonna take off? You pick one and he forwards his phone to me to where you can take the day off and don't do real estate. That's where I'm saying you need to do. So figure out how many days are you gonna work then the next one is hours worked per day. So this is where I'm going to pause for a minute. We're going to run through and talk about a schedule for you guys now, okay? So I want to talk about if you want to be successful, you need to have a schedule. And I'm going to give to you what typically should be the ideal schedule. Now, you may not be able to follow this exactly the way that I'm going to, to give it to you, but do it as close to this as you can and you will see success coming to you in your business from this, okay? So when should your schedule start? When should we start our schedule? This is a little bit of a trick question. The day after you take off. Okay, good. I like that idea. Pierce said the day after you take off. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, Julie said the day before. Good. I like it. Yeah, so your schedule should start the night before. Now, why? Why should I start my schedule the night before? Prepare. Okay, good. There's, but there's another reason. Why else? Boxuk said planning. Good, but to why? Sim to simplify the next day. So you could just, you have everything planned. You don't have to think so much. Good. So yeah, you're on the right track. Here's the idea though is now I am not a night person. So this has never been a problem for me, but what I have found is that a lot of agents end up staying up too late at night so that they don't get up on time in the morning. So the reason I say it should start the night before your schedule, your schedule for today should start with what time are you going to bed the night before? And you know what that looks like for you in terms of how much sleep you need. When do you need to go to bed so that you will get up on time so that you can do this? Because first thing in the morning, you need to do some form 
of exercise, some form of reading. You got so exercise your body, exercise your mind, then also um, eat. A lot of times people go, oh, I don't eat breakfast. Even my, I have a 20 year old son. The, the other day said that to me, oh, I don't really do much for breakfast. Well, you should. So you need to eat, okay? Which remember also yesterday we talked about relationships, health. I'm talking the health stuff right now, okay? So you need to eat. And then also I'm gonna throw in there, I usually get a laugh at this one a little bit, but I've only got Edgar here, but take a shower. I hate that I have to say that to you, but I tell you what, I have, I enjoy listening to agents make phone calls to going and just standing there and listening to them make calls. But I'll tell you, there are many times that I go stand next to them and I'm like, they did not take a shower or they didn't wash their clothes or something like they just stink. So maybe that's the way I should say it. Don't stink <laughs> at the end of the day. In fact, actually, it's a funny side note to that. So I mentioned to you, I've been training agents for the last 15 years. Well, the guy that somewhat mentored me in terms of training and things, I was asking him about 15 years ago when I first started training agents. I said, how can you tell the difference between the ones that are going to make it and the ones that are not going to make it in the business? And he said, that it's basically the only way you can tell the difference between who will make it and who will not make it is if they stink. If they stink, they aren't going to make it in the business. And uh, I, I will tell you, that's true. So I taught this class one day and I won't tell you which office, but it wasn't the one I'm in right now. But I had taught this class one day and, and I actually had said, please take a shower. Don't stink. And then I went to a different office. I almost said which office. I went to a different office, either in California or Southern Utah. Oh, wait, outside of Salt Lake. <laughs> anyway, I went down to this office and I went in there and started talking to the lady. And I could tell, like, she doesn't wash her clothes. They stink. Like, don't stink. Okay. All right. That was my sidebar for that. All right. Then next, starting at 7 a.m. or it might be 7.15 a.m. And unfortunately for you guys in California, this is going to be 6 a.m. So, but we have available to you role play every single day at 7 a.m. Utah time, 6 a.m. California time. You can get on and watch on Zoom role play. So if you guys are not doing that and you're interested in it, again, um, Throw it in the chat box if you want me to send email you the link as well for that, for the role play in the mornings that they do here. Like I say, unfortunately for you guys in California, it's at 6 a.m. I think it's 6.15 actually, 7.15 Utah time. But, um, but yeah, throw in your, um, so Jesse, throw in there that you want me to send you the link for role play though, so that I'll know when I print, because I'm going to print this chat box off. Um, but so seven o'clock is role play, where they're going to do some practice and role play. 8 a.m. then, is morning ascent. I'm going to just write it up here as MA, but morning ascent. Okay. So morning ascent starts at eight o'clock. You should be on and doing it. So Pierce said could be worse. And <laughs> yeah, that's true. If you're in Hawaii, that could be worse. All right. So 8 a.m. is going to be morning ascent. It, that usually goes to 8.30, 8.45, depending on who's doing it. If me or Jeremy's doing it, it's usually done at 8.30. If John or George is doing it, it's 8.45 or 9. But nine o'clock then and so again, on this, for you guys in California, you may adjust the time a little bit on this, meaning you'll either get an extra break in here after role play or morning ascent to go do some of these other things still. But 9 a.m. should be your prospecting time. You should be on the phone prospecting by 9 a.m. But here's what I will tell you. We do have a ton of agents who are starting at 8 a.m. So for you guys in California, really, if you're doing morning ascent at 7 a.m., you could be on the phone prospecting by eight o'clock and that would be okay, okay? So make sure that you are a, a, aware of that, that it is okay to start before nine. The laws for telemarketing say you can't do it before 8 a.m., but 8 a.m. works. So 8 a.m. or nine o'clock, you should be prospecting. From nine o'clock until at least 11 or 11.30, but I'm gonna just put up here till noon. The idea being to get 30 contacts. Okay, that's the objective. Now, what I am sharing with you is this is the schedule that Brian Burnett, so Tina Hare in California is our number one agent in terms of gross commission income. She does over $2 million every year 
in income. But Brian Burnett, who is in our St. George office in Southern Utah, is our number one agent in terms of number of transactions. Essentially what I'm giving you guys right now is his schedule that he follows. And he makes over a million dollars a year. He probably will be close to 2 million this year off of following this schedule that I'm giving you. And what you're gonna notice is this is not like that crazy of a schedule is what you're gonna see. All right, so from 9 a.m. till noon is prospecting. Then from noon till one is lunch, so go get some food. One o'clock then is lead follow-up. This is when you are going to go through and do your lead follow-up. Go through and follow up with the people. So here's the thing. We talked about a little bit yesterday. The idea is we go and do all this prospect. When we're prospecting, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, but you're prospecting for appointments is what you should be prospecting for. Uh, so Kelly, on how many transactions does Brian do? Um, he's going to be between 150 and 200 transactions this year. I think I want to say he's around 150 is pretty normal of how he does, but I think he's, he may be 175 or something. So yeah, he does a lot of transactions. So he has um, just in this past year added some buyers agents to it. He only had one in the past, but he would, and he would do about 150 transactions with one buyer's agent. And that was his dad. All right, so one o'clock is gonna be lead follow-up. Two o'clock then is gonna be appointment prep. Now, so the idea of prospecting, I didn't finish my thought. The idea of prospecting up here is to set appointments. But not everyone you talk to is going to be ready to set an appointment. Some of those people are actually going to only become leads. Meaning, like, for example, I was on today, before, right before I came up to this class, I was listening to an agent make calls. And he, while he was doing the call, turned and looked at me like, I, I don't know what to say next to this person. So actually what I did is I took over the call which is interesting actually, it's funny how that happens because even you could do this from a female to a male, you could take over in the middle of the call and people don't even notice that somebody else is talking. So right before we came up here, I was listening to this guy make phone calls and he kind of looked at me and went like, I don't know what to say next. And I said, let me take over. So I took over and, and I tried three different times to get this lady to uh, uh, agree to an appointment. She just wouldn't do it. See, so not always are you going to get an appointment, so you're going to get leads. She said, yeah, please follow up with me. Stay in touch with me because at some point I am going to buy. I'm just not ready yet. So that's the idea of this lead follow-up is you got to schedule in the time to do your lead follow-up. So many agents will, do, will go and generate a bunch of leads and then they never follow up with them. And 75% of your business is probably going to come from lead follow-up, FYI. Okay, so you got to do lead follow-up here. And then two o'clock is where you're going to prep for your appointments. Three o'clock then is when you're going to have your first appointment. And then five, oops, five o'clock would be your next appointment. So for Brian Burnett, who is doing 150 plus transactions a year, he is home by six o'clock most nights. He does build in one day of week that he will do a seven o'clock appointment, which I don't know if I'm writing too low. Oh, no, you can still see it. Uh, one day a week, he will do a seven o'clock appointment, but that's only one day a week that he will do that. So when he's prospecting, and here's part of what you need to do. So, and, and so we're kind of transitioning a little bit into tomorrow's class, but here's what you need to do. When you are prospecting, you need to be saying to people, do afternoons or evenings work better for you? And when they say afternoons, great, I've got an opening at three o'clock tomorrow. Would that work for you? See, instead of saying, well, when do you want to meet? Instead, give them options. There was one, I was at a seminar about, I don't know, a year and a half ago or so. And it had a, they had a panel and there was an agent up there talking that um, she does about $2 million a year in commissions. And here's the interesting thing with her. She is home by three o'clock every day. $2 million a year, she only works till three o'clock. So what she does though, is she's adjusted this up just a little bit to where she starts her calls at 8 a.m. Her first appointment is at 11 and then one o'clock. So when she's talking to people, she's like, would 11 o'clock or one o'clock work better? Somebody raised their hand and said, well, what do you do if somebody said, well, I can't meet until three o'clock or four o'clock or something like that? She said, I tell them, 
I don't have a I don't have appointments available at that time. I have 11 or one, which works better for you? And she said, generally they will agree to one. But in the event that she has somebody that says, I cannot do that, I have to do a different time. She's just found some agents in the office, which how many of you would go be willing to go to her and say, hey, yeah, if you get an appointment for a listing and you can't do it because they want to meet at six o'clock, I'll go do it for you and I'll pay you a referral fee. I think every one of your hands or just about every one of you guys is going to go, yeah, I'll do that. Well, that's all she's done. She's gone and just found people that said, hey, oh, great, six o'clock, great. I'm going to have my associate, Edgar, is going to come and be the one to meet with you. Then she walks out and says, hey, Edgar, I set an appointment for you for six o'clock tomorrow. See, you just have to decide what your business is going to look like and what this schedule is going to look like. You decide how you're going to do that. Now, here's the key thing. In the event that somebody said to you, I want to meet with you at 9 a.m. and I'm going to list my $15 million home with you, most of you are probably not going to say, well, I already have an appointment. You're going to go do that listing appointment is my guess. Well, if you're going to do that, then the key thing with this for this to work is you have to say, okay, I'm going to go on that listing appointment at 9 a.m. That means my prospecting is dropping down here into this area. You have to reschedule it. The secret to success for you guys is this. Treat your prospecting like a listing appointment. You would never no-show a listing appointment, never no-show your prospecting. If you will do this, if you'll put together and follow this schedule, here is what I will promise you. It will work it will 100% work for you to follow this schedule and you will start to produce if you will just stick to this. Now, if I'm a new agent, how, how, how new are you, Edgar? For, okay, close enough. Okay, my guess is you don't have any listing appointments tonight at two o'clock or three o'clock or five. Am I correct? Okay, so he said I'm correct which means you don't have any appointment prep you need to do at two o'clock today. So guess what you should be doing from two o'clock till five o'clock today? More prospecting, you got it. See, when, if you're a new agent, you're gonna prospect here, but if you don't have appointments, then you're gonna prospect here as well until you start to get appointments. And then once the appointments start to show up, now then you can quit doing this prospecting and you can be doing just this one. All right. Um, questions on that schedule? Any questions? All right. I so, have a question, Russ. Yeah, go ahead. What, what do you, um, as far as prospecting, you call everything equal? I mean, whether you're cold calling, whether you're calling friends or, or you know, even uh, people that you don't know well that you put on your list or um, what are your thoughts about that? Okay, yeah, so who to call? So we'll talk more about this tomorrow, actually, but here's what I will tell you is for Brian Burnett, who follow this, this schedule, here's what he does is he does, let me erase this. He calls new for sale by owners first. So the first thing he does is he calls new for sale by owners. Then he calls new expireds. Then he calls old for sale by owners. So meaning the people that he's uh, not gotten a hold of from the day before or whatever. And old, then old expireds. And then he will call SOI. And then he will call just listed or just sold. So that's kind of the ideal way you want to do it. But I'm, what I'm going to tell you tomorrow, and actually even part of today, we're going to hit on here in just a second on this business plan, is ultimately you need two or three ways that you're going to prospect, and one of them needs to be your SOI. So tomorrow, the idea of what we're going to go through tomorrow in class is we're going to talk about all the different ways that are available for you to prospect, and then how to go and do it effectively in each of those areas. And if you will choose two or three, one of them being your SOI, if you will choose two or three, you're going to be good. It'll work. So, so, but I'll say more about that tomorrow. All right. Next then. So we talked on here. Oh, actually that's right where we're at on the business plan. The next thing on the business plan, number five, I don't know how well you can see, there we go, is prospecting, right? Let me put it here. Okay. So sources of business. 
So we'll talk more about this tomorrow, but you should be choosing two or three ways you're gonna do it. So that's where you're gonna write that down. Total hours prospected. Once you've put together your schedule here, you should be able to look at that and say, okay, here's how many hours I'm gonna prospect and how many average contacts per hour is gonna vary. We talked yesterday about using a dialer versus not using a dialer. So the average contacts per hour is gonna vary if you're using a dialer or not using one or if you're out door knocking, which I think uh, I've heard that you technically can't door knock in California still, is that correct? See, Governor Newsom again, thumbs down, not thumbs up, Kelly, thumbs down, I'm just kidding. All right, so total contacts that you need to do every day. So if it's gonna be 30 a day, then put down 30 contacts a day, whatever. Total doors knocked, I guess in California, none for the time being, but an appointment set. How many appointments are you going to set? Well, I'm going to tell you a story tomorrow about what you should be doing if I haven't already, but you should be setting one appointment a day is what your objective should be. All right, listings, total listings attended. So if I'm, oh, I've erased it. If I was going to try to do five listings over the next year, because saying that I needed to 25 transactions and I assumed 20 were going to be buyers. If I'm going to do 20, or excuse me, five listings, I probably need to attend at least 10. If you're a newer agent, you might need to attend more than 10, might be 15 to get five. Well, total taken then, I've been to try to get five. And in our current market, the percentage sold is the next thing. Well, you're probably gonna sell, in today's market, you should be selling almost all of them, okay? So I would be saying 90% on percentage sold. All right, sphere of influence. How many total people in your SOI as of today? Um, write that down. Total people you want to have in your SOI by the end of the year, write that down. And the difference between how many you have currently and you want to have by the end of the year is going to be the total number you need to add. So you're going to put that in there. I will email my SOI every month. I will mail my SOI. You should probably do every quarter. I will personally call my SOI at least quarterly. We'll talk more about that in the SOI class um, next week. And I will post on social media networks blank times per day. Like ultimately think of it as a, for me, I think of it as a four to one. George said yesterday, I think three to one. I think it's a four to one ratio. You should be posting four, three times. And maybe this is what he meant is three times that are non-real estate related for every one real estate related thing you post on social media. So three, so four to one, four, three or four times that are non-real estate to one every one time you do real estate related. Um, oh, Kyle's asking, how late can you make calls according to telemarketing laws? Uh, that's a good question. I want to say it's eight o'clock at night as well. It might be nine though. I can't remember now. I've always only worried about how early you can call. I'm never worried about how late, but I think it, it's either eight or nine. Uh, Ross, I have a quick question. Yeah, go um, ahead. When using the Reddick system um, and a contact has like four or five numbers and like three of those are um, do not call. Do you proceed to call the other numbers or because he has so many do not calls, you just move along? No, I would, if there was one that was not on the do not call, I would call that number. Oh, okay. Okay. I was wondering about that. Yeah, Thank you. I would call them. Yep. Perfect. All right. So next page of this, if you guys have it, I apologize to those that don't I'll try it. I don't know why that won't show up and maybe, and maybe it is if you're on the phone. But the next section is eight is mindset and it talks about books and CDs, which we obviously need to update to audio instead of CDs. But what books are you gonna read and when will you read them by? What audio things are you listening to and when? And then to company trainings, you can go through and fill out skill sets. We talked about the skill sets yesterday and I had you rate yourself. So hopefully as you fill out the business plan, the reason I had you rating yourself is you know I will role play how many times per week like I told you, we have it available five days a week here on Lawn Zoom. My role play partners will be, you can get some role play partners. I will chant and uh, memorize the following scripts and I will write out the following scripts and be coached by, all of you should have a coach, which is probably your office manager. And then the ne next page is what specific skills you're gonna master. So that should be based on what we talked about yesterday when I had you rate yourself on a scale of one to 10 on those skills. Which ones are you gonna work on mastering? Put in your business plan. And then accountability, who are you gonna have hold you accountable? And what syst and then number 11 is what systems and strategies are you gonna work on? And then number 12 goes back to this. Oh, I already erased it. Is what are the challenges and solutions that you have? So 
Anyway, all right, so I apologize. I will get sent out to you guys the business plan. Anybody that had put in their email address in the chat box, same with the role play. If you guys had wanted that, I will send that out to you as well. And which, by the way, it's totally fine for you guys if, if at first you want to jump on to the role play in the morning uh, at 6 a.m. for you guys in California and just tell Rick or Ruby that's running the role play that, hey, I just want to observe today. That's totally fine if you want to do that and get kind of a feel for what's going on. But then eventually jump in and start doing some of the role play. The way you're going to get better is get involved in doing role play. So, all right. Any other questions, comments? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, let's say we put this uh, plan in place, uh, excuse me, the schedule. And someone says they're not available in the evening or let's say they are available in the evening, but you've got the next two days scheduled. The example you gave is you pass the lead on to someone else. And as a new agent, you're not willing to do that. But at time is of the essence in this real estate market and setting appointment for three days out is kind of difficult. How do you work that for us? So um, I guess, uh, let me make sure I understand what you're saying. So if, if somebody wants to meet at a time you don't want to, or just you are right, already they, busy? They, I'm already busy for the next two days. I have my evening slots full, but oh. I'm a new agent. I don't want to pass on that lead for a referral or do I? Sure. Even well, though I'm a new agent. Yeah, great question. So I would agree with you. You probably don't want to pass it on. You want to keep it. But if, if as you said, if it's a scenario, I guess the first question I would ask you is, is it, more likely or would it be better to go on that one and reschedule one of your other ones would be one of the things I would oh, say okay. to try to do. Oh, good. But, okay. but if not, then I would try to just schedule it for whenever you can schedule it. But at the same time, if the option is I lose it all together or I refer it out, I'm going to refer it out. But, right. but I would say, yeah, if, if they, if they need to meet, call one of the other ones and say, Hey, I just wanted to see, would it be possible if we rescheduled to a different time? Well, there's the idea too that, hey, I'm booked up for the next two days. That gives them an impression that you're a pretty successful real estate agent and I'm Correct. worth waiting for. Correct. But like you said, if, if it looks like you, hey, no, I have to do it then and I need it on the market today, like then I would refer it if I had to or call somebody else and see if I could reschedule them. Got you. It's a good problem to have. Okay, cool. Uh, so, Christine, it's on YouTube, not Facebook. So, if you go to YouTube and do a search for Peak Agent Training, you'll find my channel. And then from there, you can find all the classes. So, Okay. Well, hey, thanks for being with me, guys. So, for tomorrow, we'll start same time, 9 o'clock in California, 10 o'clock in Utah. We're going to go through and talk about lead generation. And we're going to just hit on how to convert leads, basically. So, how do we get appointments set and stuff? So, thanks for being here. Finish filling out that business plan. If you have questions on it, let me know. I will go through this afternoon, like I said, and send out the business plan to you guys and also links for the role play. So cool. Thanks for being here. Talk to you guys later. Thanks, Russ. See ya.